I think it's time to move on to the next speaker. It's Michaela Popper-Wyatt, and she's also the organizer of this amazing series of workshops. And yeah, so I'm very curious about your talk and I hand over to her. Brilliant, thank you so much. So um, let's see how I play on this Mac, okay. So my talk will be on, on oppressive speech and how that shapes norms. And also I will relate that to, to negotiation uh, games as we, as we saw in already in, in um, Roland's talk. So uh, I'm very grateful to the DAS team uh, uh, to shape my thinking about game theory. So in the interest of time, I will just uh, speed up. So the goal of my project is really kind of, uh, there are two axes. The first is to give an account of social oppressive games and that explain how structural disadvantage emerges in a society and endures. And that's what uh, Roland's talk uh, kind of um, uh, illustrated. And my second pillar is to look at uh, what's going on, uh, you know, how, how speech and conversational games can be oppressive and how that uh, basically feeds into the this, this structure, structural disadvantage. And uh, in particular, at the heart of the, the program is precisely this feedback loop between the two uh, kinds of games, the oppressive social games and conversational oppressive games. And in particular, I'm interested in the, mo in the interactions between those two games, how we move on from the social game to the conversational game. Uh, in that what goes on in a conversation depends clearly on background conditions and norms uh, in the social game and, and vice versa. What we do or fail to do in a conversation, uh, they will further impact on the structures and norms in the social game, creating in turn uh, conditions for future conversations. So I use game theory to explain these interactions and game theory useful for two things. Uh, first, it provides a mechanism by which oppression or, or, or social disadvantage actually happens. And second, it also helps us understand why speakers want to shift the norms uh, so as to oppress particular kinds of, 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 of groups. So I'm gonna talk about four things. Uh, first of all, it's, it's uh, the first part is what, what uh, Roland already covered. And so I will skip directly to the move from social games to the conversational games. So I want to, oops. Um, yeah, basically I want to, 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 to look at the oppressive games um, in a more, qualitative, uh, perhaps intuitive, grounded way by drawing on uh, social norm theories. So a key element of this is the idea of social norm, uh, social roles. Yeah, and uh, very simply in our multiple social interactions, we take on many social roles at the same time, which we can shift from one setting to another. So social roles are very useful because they index at the, a great deal of rules and norms governing our social interactions. They determine the ways you behave or expect to behave and the ways people react to you. So does they define what counts as appropriate or inappropriate behavior, uh, the, depending on the social roles you have in particular social settings. And this is because they bring uh, a great deal, like a ready-made social know-how uh, that, that um, precisely it enables us to, to, to make predictions and, and, and plan effectively, effectively in social settings. And this is because they bring, um, you know, they assign uh, in the part of this package that we have a lot lots of rights, responsibilities, obligations, expected behaviors, and so on. So you have a lot of, um, yeah, it, it's, it's a whole kind of, it's like a mental shortcut that helps you navigate various social interactions. And social roles are also embedded in, in, in social hierarchies. And so they are uh, coupled with power relations for, for specific social interactions. And those could change as, as you move on from one context to another. So they're contextually modulated. And uh, so, and, and some of these power relations will be justified by a, a parent, child, um, but others will be unjustified like master slave and, and, and various other relationships that we have nowadays that are unjust. So, and the idea is that when I change my social roles, uh, or my social role is changed by someone else, or, or you know, I, I, yeah, I, we'll see in a minute how, 
that that means that my power relationships with the people I'm interacting will also change. And that can happen even within a single interaction, as, as we'll see later. So another key uh, element of, of the framework is that as, as just as we had the social roles uh, in, in social games, we can add corresponding discourse roles or, or conversational roles as part of the, the, the conversational score. And this discourse you know, what are they? They are inherited basically from the long-term social roles that you have outside of the conversation, but they will only exist within the span of the conversation. So they, they cease to exist after the conversation ends. And they're important. And also they're important to distinguish them because they, they can affect what, you know, how you are addressed in a conversation, what is said about you, what you are expected or permitted to say, and, and what you say, how that will be interpreted. So it can be that the case that you know the school's roles assigned by the participant sometimes does not correspond to any social roles that that you have outside of the conversation. Think of uh, you know pretend play or or even mistaken identity in conversation. Suppose you go to to the hospital uh, and and there is a mistake uh, that someone mistakes you mistakes a patient for a doctor and the patient goes along. So you, you the, the, sometimes you have a perfect overlap between the, the school's role and the conversation, the, the social roles that you have outside. So it's like, what you see is what you get. But other times uh, the discourse role may not be, uh, uh, may be hidden or unobservable. So, and uh, again, as, as we had with, with social roles, um, you can have a change uh, or, or the discourse will inherited will have very different different power uh, relationships. So that holds for discourse role as well. And when a discourse role will change, it can change the power relationships that you have uh, with, with other participants and the, and the interaction. So your discourse role need not stay the same throughout the conversation. It will change and, and, and that will go on to just play, uh, uh, to, to, to give you an example. <laughs> And um, so this is a, 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 a clip from the In the Heat of the Night uh, and uh, the, 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 the story behind is that the character played by Sunny Bautier, uh, who you'll see in a minute, um, uh, he's been arrested at the trade session on, on, on suspicion of murder in a small town in Mississippi in the 60s. So and now he's questioned by, uh, by the police. And so the initial roles that discourse roles that Mr. Chips will, uh, will have are that he's a black man in the South and after, you know, just after the, the segregation, and he's also a murder suspect. So listen carefully how the chief uh, of police addresses him. Don't worry about him. Got a name, boy? Virgil Tibbs. Virgil. <laughs> I don't think we're going to have any trouble, are we, Virgil? No trouble at all. Oh, you can go now, Sam. So on the basis of the, the, the this cross of being a suspect murder and a black man, you see the power. Meanwhile, you just killed yourself a white man, just about the most important white man we got around here, and picked yourself up a couple of hundred dollars. I earned that money 10 hours a day, seven days a week. Colored can't earn that kind of money. Boy, hell, that's more than I make in a month. Now, where did you earn it? Philadelphia. Mississippi. Pennsylvania. I just what you do up there, little old Pennsylvania, earn that kind of money. I'm a police officer. Discourse roles goes go from being a murder suspect, a member of an oppressed group, now to being a fellow of a police officer. And interestingly, his social role of being a police officer existed before the conversation started, but he was hidden for the, for the chief of the police. So it wasn't a discourse role per se. That's the why we need the distinction between the two. Oh yeah. So as we're just the act of saying, I'm a police officer and backing it up with a, with a, with a, showing the badge. He's, he's well, now you are the, you are the number one homicide expert. That's right. Boy, I bet you get to look at a lot of dead bodies, don't you? Lots. Well, 
I want. Well, I, no, I just thought maybe, uh, maybe you wouldn't mind taking a look at this one. No, thanks. Why not, expert? Because I've got a train to catch. Oh, wait a minute. That train don't leave at 12 o'clock noon. Look, they pay you $162.39 a week just to look at bodies. Why can't you look at this one? Why can't you look at it for yourself? Because I'm not an expert. Officer. So I, I hope you can see that how we move from and then the power dynamics in the conversation changes as as the the discourse roles come in and out of salience now that he's 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 not only a police officer a, a fellow an equal part uh, yeah on a, on equal social role as were well. uh, he's he's also the 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 leading homicide in uh, Philadelphia City uh, Police Station and you see that at the end the, the relationship becomes kind of quite deferential and at the end he's addressed with uh, with an uh, officer with an honorific basically so it's it's in a way that shows to me that the reason why we need to have this distinction between social role on the one hand and and, and discourse roles uh, on the other hand even though you you might think that they're kind of the same entity but but if we make room for discourse roles we can see how that can uh, we, we can change things um so now I want to move on and give uh, focus on a, a particular example of an oppressive act. Um, so we're looking at a, at a slurring move, and, um, and and I don't want to go too, too, too far into details, but obviously slurs are, are on, a, on a continuum. Some are uh, more offensive, more oppressive than others. And I'm going to look on the on the kind of the structure, the blueprint of, of, of an oppressive slurs. So so. We know what they are, and uh, my claim is that what happens when someone is slurring, essentially, they are, they are uh, using the slur to grab power in the conversation. So, and this is achieved via an act of assigning the target a low power role and assuming yourself as a speaker a, a powerful role. And the goal of this is to achieve and maintain a power imbalance in the conversation. So you're sending the target a clear message that about how, how they're going to be treated in a way worthy of, of a low power person in, you know in the same way you treat subordinates and and and, and kind of that, that they will that their actresses are going to be treated and in, in, in how you think subordinates ought to be treated so how does this work um it only works because uh because the slur reflects or piggybacks on a historical or current power imbalance and seeks to reenact that that power imbalance within the limits of the current conversation and this will alter the power dynamics in the conversation by changing the rules and and, and how the, the game will evolve and here also a key idea is that uh, uh what 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 does the work is, is, is Lewis's idea of, of accommodation. So as long as no one objects or re rejects your move, the imbalanced um, discourse rules will be accommodated and, and then the slur move counts as a correct play. And that makes it uh, makes further kind of similar moves permissible or other moves impermissible. So now I want to move back to uh, basically the question that I'm really uh, trying to get an answer to is namely how, how we move from the conversation, the effects on the conversational game back into the social game. Uh, when you make a, a move in the conversation, how does it affect your social role? As we saw, it affects your discourse role, but it's unclear how it affects your social role. It, it sounds like it shouldn't because you know, a slur is not, uh, is not like a performative, like when a vicar says, I declare a man and wife, it's not like you're, you know, in the same way, you're he, his pronouncement will, will, will have a legal effect on, 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 on changing permanently the social roles of, of those people. And that doesn't seem to be the case with, with uh, the slurring utterance. So how is it that uh, uh, slurring, you know, whatever hate speech or oppressive speech will have long-term societal effects? That's the question that I'm, I want to focus on. So it sounds like they can't, but uh, because they're not performatives. So uh, the question is, what are the mechanisms that explains uh, that move beyond the conversation? And so I, I want to think about social interactions in general that you have with various people at various times as part of a larger game, a larger social game in which you will have small, you know, uh, repeated conversations with different people at different times and so on. And each game, 
the conversational and the larger social game will be governed by rules and norms associated with the roles of the participants. And you can have two, two moves between these two games. Uh, a downstream move, we import uh, typically social roles into the conversational game. Yeah, and thus they become the school's roles that will operate locally. However, we also want a, an upstream move, namely that whatever happens in the conversation, however we, we, we kind of shape those roles within the conversation, those effects will, will, be, will be able to be exported outside of the conversation into the social game. So um, we, and the question is now, how do we explain this export move? And this is something more controversial and I want to provide you an intuition as to why I think that happens. So uh, here is just a very quick representation. So basically this would be the, 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 the social game. Yeah, we're, we're basically, we move from, from one state to another, there is a transition, yeah. And that transition may be represented by, by the outcome of a particular conversations or perhaps many conversations and so on that will always feed up into the social game. So first we have a simple import of whatever roles we have outside of the conversation will be just reflected, just imported into, into the current here in our conversation. And those will, will just affect the same, uh, we move from one state to another, we, we change the conversation, yeah, it's always updating uh, whatever moves we make with language, let's say. Then a next move would be to say that uh, not only we have that, you know, what you see is what you get, we also can do certain forced move or, you know, sometimes it can be play, pretend or anything, other, other things where you assign roles to other participants in the conversation or you assign a role to the, you know, you, you, you assume a role, a role to yourself in order to achieve certain conversational effects. And then whatever, I have, whatever the, the outcome of the conversation here, we want to say that it exports and then we'll make this, this move, basically will shift the norms in the social game. And then, oops, okay, I'll come back later. So in a way, my, my question is like, what's the precise mechanism that explains this role export move? And um, so that's a bit, I, I have some three candidate mechanisms I'm not sure that's the, 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 the entire story, but, but let's, let's see how they work. So first of all, you can think that what's going on, uh, so here what we want to say is like, how does the listener uh, derives the fact that the target has this low power role as their social role? That's the question. So they can go through a sort of, uh, you know, making backward inferences using uh, if then rules. So you start with this, let's say a default premise. If, if the target or the agent has, has a, a given social role, then they will have the conversational role. Yeah, then you move on, you hear, they hear the utterance that assigns the target a conversational low power role. And then it looks like they could, you know, they could be entitled or whatever, they, they draw the conclusion that the target has the, has the, 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 so the corresponding low power social role. How does this go through? You, you might think that uh, it's sort of, I want to, to, to draw on, on Geis and Zwicky uh, work on, on, on the idea of invited inference. So namely they note that uh, hearers tend to perfect conditionals to white conditionals and that can lead to all sorts of various um, fallacies of reasoning. What I'm interested here, I think is the, or the relevant is the affirming the consequence. So if you start with the inheritance rule, yeah, if then, then you affirm the consequent that the target has a such a role and then one would feel entitled to, to draw the conclusion that the target has the social role. So obviously it's not um, you know, a, a sound inference, but nevertheless, oh, that, that's something that might be going on in, 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 in here. So um, uh, reasoning process. Another way to think about this is, is um, and we'll see some problems with that. Another way to think about this is the Bayesian updating mechanism. So uh, the hearer basically imports the belief here uh, that, that the target has uh, the oppressed role or, you know, he considers the two hypotheses. Does the target has the, has the uh, oppressive, oppressed social role or it doesn't? Yeah, and just for simplicity, think that they are 50-50. Uh, 
then they hear the utterance, the conversational move, where the, 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 the effect of the utterance is to increase the probability so, so that the target has, is likely to have the oppressed social role. So they work out how likely the utterance is given each, each uh, possible hypothesis, whether the target has or not the, the oppressed social role. And then Bayes' rule updates the probability of each, of each, um, of each hypothesis and gives us the, the posterior. Yeah? So you would have an increase of the, of the, of the, like, of the uh, an increase of the probability that they have the oppressed social role. And this, this posterior will then become the, the, the prior belief, which we, we just start, which will be higher than this one, and so on and, and, and so forth. So, but the idea is that this, this posterior yeah, is what the listener will export as, the, as, they believe, as their belief of the hearing a slurring utterance. And so again, you, you might think, yeah, we might think of some problems and that's what I want to turn up. So, so in the case of the invited inference, you might think that, look, uh, the invited inference rule doesn't always hold. Uh, you know, having a social role doesn't necessarily mean that it will be imported to become a discourse role. So that might that might be a sort of a, a problem to that kind of explanation, and and perhaps a problem to the Bayesian explanation uh, would be to say that the Bayesian updating doesn't admit the possible explanation that actually this speaker is simply bigoted and hence the social role doesn't hold. So we want a, a way of kind of of differentiating different types of possible uh, listener in the audience. So some might be more inclined to, to do the Bayesian updating in this way, and they will then increase their probability to, 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 to think that, that the social role uh, holds, but others might, might have other, uh, you know, might resist or reject or have other beliefs that, that uh, simply clash with that and, 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 or simply conclude that the speaker is bigoted and so the, the updating will, won't, won't hold. And another perhaps more simplistic way is to just say that um, all that's going on is an associative rule. Yeah, this, this tracks the association in the, in the hearer's mind between members of a group and the role that it's deemed to be uh, appropriate to them and uh, you can track that with like the PR here it's not a, strictly a probability but just a number between zero and one so it captures simply the, the strength of the association between the target and the role so when it's zero there's no no association and when it's moving to and one meaning that it will be a strong association and alpha is just, just a positive uh, a small positive number what, Matt, what, what the effect here is that when a slur is made, the rule is applied. Yeah, so you always kind of have this updating. The P P R prime will be the updating of the old P R, and so what you see that each each uh, uh, slurring utterance basically will uh, will increase uh, will will kind of move the P R closer to to one, thereby kind of strengthening the association. And if the slur is not made, you can have a similar rule that weakens the association, but perhaps more slowly. So the idea is, is just very, I mean, the intuition is very, very simple. That, that, um, that what matters is having a sort of long-term link in the audience mind that between the, the target, between a particular social oppressed role and the target based on their group membership. And, and the strength of this association is, is increased every time an assignment is made to, to, to of, a, of a low power discourse role. Yeah, so, and then the association will increase gradually over multiple uses. It will probably never reach one, but it will kind of tend to go towards one. So when a, a new interaction will begin involving that audience member and a member of the target group, then the social role uh, the oppressed social role will be imported in, in the conversational game in a manner proportional to the to the strength of them uh, of that association. So now we kind of reached the full full uh, of our feedback loop. Basically, as I said, once once we shift the norms in at the level of the social game, then that would make it possible. And you know, over repetition and repetition, that norm will be more and more entrenched. 
that will make it possible to for, for that role to be uh, to be imported in future conversations. And this is one way of understanding how how conversational games. So what happens here, and and the social structures feed one one another to to perpetuate and reinforce unjust norms. So now I think. I mean, those are two candidate, three candidate mechanisms. I think also what, what matters though, is it's not just a, a sort of um, epistemic updating that goes on in, in Heber's mind who, who are predisposed to, to, to as it were, um, pick up on, on, on the bigot suggestion. Um, what matters, I think, is also uh, the, the, the type of relationships between uh, participants in a, in a conversation or interaction. So I think one way to go further and to make a, a more kind of realistic uh, model is to look perhaps at a network modeling and also think about the, the sort of uh, trust binding between the participants. And I think a very interesting way to think about it is, is, is the coalitions that can emerge or uh, you know shift within a single interaction. So one intuitive thing is just, if you look at the first picture, you know, you, you may have, let's say that A is the bigot uh, targeting a member of an oppressed group and then C perhaps is a, is a bigot as well. So, uh, you know, whether he's, um, you, you can have this like an intra bigot talk when you have an alliances between uh, A and, 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 and C, you unite together to, to, attack, uh, uh, to attack the target. So, uh, you know, and they can just simply nod or, or, or express their approval in any other way. Uh, perhaps in, a, in a, the different configuration, you might have a bigot attacking uh, the target, but let's say uh, a, a target sympathizer present in the audience just kind of stands up and, and speaks for them attacking the bigot and you know, calling, up, for calling them out for, for what they are. So I think th these kind of relationships are really critical in determining how, how the, 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 the group dynamics uh, forms and, and, and can shift within a, within a single conversation. And that will alter, yeah, whether there is a resistance move or whether, well, whether there is an accommodation of the slur move and you will have different, different, different outcomes. Uh, now I think the time is running. And so I will move on to, what I want to do now is to basically combine the type of modeling that, that Roland presented with a societal Nash demand game and, and uh, add to that uh, a way of modeling the oppressive speech act. Um, so I'm, I'm, it's still kind of work in progress and I'm still kind of thinking about how to, to think about the oppressive uh, act. Is it as just a form of, of signaling? And this is what, what Anton looked at as a sort of a warning signaling or perhaps think a sort of aggressive type of signaling like for what we have from, from, from uh, Animal Kingdom and so on. So just very briefly, um, the way we did it, so it's um, here, we don't do the replicated dynamics, we just look at an agent-based dynamics, the best response, uh, kind of expecting max type of dynamics where each agent, so we have the two populations, blues and reds, and then each agent has a memory, sort of a typical uh, four, four bids, and then they're always updated. So, uh, and uh, we have, uh, the memory is used to predict other agents' policy. So there is no learning, no imitation, and they only pick up the strategy that maximizes their expected payoff. And um, so um, what we see is that, uh, as in the model that, that Roland discussed, but there is no uh, slurring act yet. So when you have just a uh, differential and disagreement points between the two population, you tend to see uh, this, uh, this divergence um, in, in, in the fact that the, the reds will, will get, will, will, will tend to consistently bid L, whereas uh, blues will, will consistently uh, bid high. Uh, and so they will get more of the resources. And when and one way to sort of, as it were, uh, have a push to a push back to this this sort of outcome is by introducing a, a moral norm, and so we can implement this by by constraining the bids against the out group such that they match those of the in groups. So basically, you just the intuition is you 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 treat everyone equally, and with this role you should with this rule in place you should you should see um, a fair play, um, sort of a fair 
division of resources. So this reflects a fair society in which agents with more bargaining power basically don't exploit it to secure further advantages. And I was thinking, you know, is this a moral norm? We, we did encode it. Uh, it would be nice to see how it actually emerges. And it's a question whether it's a moral norm or, or, or a social norm that, that people kind of may deviate from or depending on like how, how what is the motivation, whether it's a conditional or interdependent norm. Anyway, so moving on, what we see is that uh, by adding this, this, this moral norm, we basically reach uh, a convergence in their, in their bids. So they play, they tend to play fair. Now, what is the slur doing? And the claim is that basically the slur acts, uh, acts as, a, as a sort of undermining the, the moral or the norm, the social norm of equality, let's, let's call it. So uh, the prediction is that, um, you know, they, they this, the, basically the blues, the population with the higher the bargaining advantage, they, uh, they, they, they don't want to apply the moral norm to everyone. Yeah, so they think like, oh, you are red. Uh, you know, I may love everyone, the magentas, the greens, the spotties, what have you, but I don't like reds. Uh, because they are in my mental model, they're not fully people. So the moral norm doesn't apply to them. So uh, that will explain a certain propensity to slur. And, and the more racist the blue agent is, the more likely they are to use uh, a slur in negotiation with, with, with the red agent. So what we see is that, um, and obviously here we come back to the question of like, who is part of the audience? Um, Michaela, you are... Uh at the end of your time already. So you should come to an end in the next five minutes or so. Yes, that's good. So um, so, 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 basically here, we were thinking to, to, to look at how this behavior spreads. Yeah, and, and the idea is that what we have is a belief revision um, that, 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 you know, when you are a blue agent and, and here is Lord, your prior will shift so that they, that they become a little bit more racist towards, towards uh, uh, reds. So that's what we see, the effect of the slurring norm. Again, we, 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 we come back to a divergence and, and the unfair, um, unfair uh, split of the resources. So um, just to conclude by saying that we, we saw some mechanisms of, of, or, of, of, of reducing the oppression by implementing more norms of equality. It would be nice to see how they emerge rather than being encoded. And also we saw that slurs um, um, tend to undermine those norms by establishing uh, oppressive norms. And I will stop here. Thank you. So that's the end. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, so the floor is open for questions. Uh, Sandy has a question, I see. Yes, Saya. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I, I was raising my, my Zoom hand. I don't know the, the proper protocol, so forgive me. Uh, Michaela, thank you so much for this. Um, my question focuses really on the, the mechanisms for, um, for seeing the, the imports and the exports and also for what's going on. I, I wonder, whether or not we're going in the wrong direction if we want a, uh, a cognitive mechanism for um, the ways in which slurs uh, work. One, one fact that I've, I've learned, I don't know if I've learned this from you or from others who work on slurs, apparently most slurs that are used are used by an in-group about an out-group when the out-group is not present. Mm -hmm. And that leads me to think that their function is, may not necessarily be to assign a role so much as it is an invitation to those around here to share a perspective. And I wonder whether that shouldn't be seen as cognitive so much as, a, if I can make the distinction between a cognitive and effective, maybe more effective uh, with an A than cognitive. I'm wondering what you think about that. Yeah, I think indeed that, that's what most people always tend to say that, that you know, that's an empirical fact that um, that, that, that biggest kind of tend to, as it were, yeah, talk among themselves, so intra-bigger talk. 
And I think in a way that's telling because there is clearly a cost when you when you make a slurring move, you 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 could be you know you expose yourself to various various possibilities. One of them being escalation, fight, or other people resisting, and so on. So there is there is a cost. That's why I think in a way, one way it's like it's a sort of this this aggressive, as you were animal we see in animal kingdom aggressive signaling. Like I, I stand, I stand my territory, and I kind of try to intimidate. That's when it's sort of in a direct use, the directly addressed to the target. Uh, I think in a way, uh, it's true. When an intrabiga talk, the function would be different because the target is not present. Uh, the function is well, what what Jeff Nunberg always says is sort of this this a sign of affiliation. You, you sign, sort of show allegiance to your group. And, and in a way, also that sort of, it's important because you want to strengthen that group, in-group solidarity and the fact, aren't we great and all this? And you also want a kind of a critical mass of people around you. And it's important, I think, for me, the, the, the mechanism of recruiting new people. And I think, I think that that works both in you know when the target is present or absent in the sense that as a bigot you 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 send a signal like look what I can achieve you know and and sort of not send them necessarily an invitation but it's like it's like the, the sort of uh, learning by examples like uh, you know giving others incentives to do the same if they're motivated or disposed by the same the, the, the same motivation. Uh, so uh, you mentioned perspective, so whether the, whether it matters, I mean, clearly uh, those social, the, 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 the social roles in play, they have cognitive, affective, value, you know, moral value laden ingredients in them. Um, and and I think that the, the idea of social role is more is, is rich because it kind of gives you all that in a package. It's sort of a way of treating the people, a way of seeing them, uh, you know, uh, the, the perspective that you take. The pers and, and what matters in a way for me is the sort of this, this long-term distal memory that you want to establish with the others. You sort of want to, to, to make them think, feel in the same way, take on the same perspective. And, um, and and obviously that will work only if they are, as it were, already predisposed into into seeing that. But the slur itself would just kind of move a little bit, a, a, a further inch into their, as it were, disposition to really kind of even go out and and, and slur themselves. And I hope it's responsive. If not, we we talk later. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, I see that there's a question by David Viva. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the talk, Mihaela. Um, I think my question is related. So you've, in all your, you've done lots of work on slurs and pointed out many of their um, special characteristics. So I guess I'm interested in um, what, which of those characteristics are specifically relevant in the type of model that you're talking about here. So it seems that um, other markers of um, social role, other ways of expressing a social role might in this model have a similar effect. So, so um, referring, for example, to uh, directly to whatever the color of someone's skin or their accent, or like, you're not, a, you're not from around here, kind of a, a comment. Um, or for that matter, simply directly using um, you know in, in uh, things that demand a power asymmetry so just thinking of politeness theory um, anything face threatening or which could include telling just give just an imperative for example mm -hmm. uh, without without um, a caveat so all those things could as far as I could tell have a similar effect in indicating a temporary discourse role Mm -hmm. what makes the model specific to slurs or in what ways might you like to develop the model so that specific properties of slurs uh, came out as 
I came out differentially relative to other forms of speech. Right. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. So, uh, I mean, I think the only the only difference with those other forms and kind of that there is in the same ballpark of basically establishing an ex exclusionary speech act, as it were, of othering, uh, yeah, othering the target. Um, will be to do with, I think, clearly what the group membership is taken, which, which you know, that would be part of the semantics of the slur, whereas in all other cases, when you say like, oh, we don't belong here, or men, men only club, or things like that, um, or, or, you know, um, so the group membership will be the first ingredient that, that, that differentiates them, then uh, the, the discourse role assignment would, in the case of the slur, would be a conventional one. So, uh, I don't want to say you know it's like lex yeah perhaps yeah lexicalized but but still a matter of pragmatics in the sense that um it, it picks up yeah it, it picks up this this low power role assigned to the target which is not necessarily obvious or easy to to to, to assign in other cases um I think actually the, the third ingredient, which really will make the difference, is, is the idea of the history of oppression on which a slur is piggybacking, which may not be present in the case of a simple pejorative or, or those other forms of, of exclusionary acts. That need not, you know, you may achieve the same effect of putting someone down and uh, excluding them, but, um, and obviously they will, uh, there will be a difference in degree of, of the, the offensive force, as it were, precisely to do with the fact that, you know, um, yeah, with, with the existing uh, structural oppression that is, that, uh, that the slurring movie is speaking backing on, uh, that would be like three ingredients to distinguish between, between different classes. Clearly, in a way, there are like on a continuum in the sense that you can see similarities, they, you know, at a very high level, you could you could say all achieve this effect of, of, of excluding, and then it will it will matter the specific. I think the, the, the specific will come out of the, the richness of the, the, the roles involved. You know, so some will be more yeah, rich or more kind of um, grounded in, in specific asymmetric power relationships than others. And, and that will come with the difference in, in, in the uh, uh, offensive force or, or oppressive effect. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so we have plenty of time for more questions. So if you have a question, uh, I have a problem seeing raised hands. So just type Q or question into the chat so that I can see it. Um, yeah, Kevin. As a question. Hi, um, I, I hope if you answered this in the middle of the talk, I, I apologize. I had an internet connection issue, so I lost a couple of minutes there. So <laughs> my apologies if, if I'm just asking you to say something you already talked about. But um, I was sort of curious about the use, what you might think of as category mistake uses, although mistake is not really the right word. So when I, when I use a slur, well, I wouldn't do this, but when someone uses a slur, um, uh, against another person who is distinctly not a member of the group that the slur is intended for. So a white person calls another white person by a racist slur or, uh, you know, or something like that. Or also there are those, you know, uh, categories where there's some ambiguity and part of the purpose of the slur is in fact to, you know, determine whether the person is a member of that group. So for instance, the use of anti-gay slurs sometimes has that property, which is I'm insulting you both by I'm, I'm, I'm slurring you, but I'm slurring you in a way by suggesting that you're a member of a group that you may not want to be a member of. Mm -hmm. um, and those strike me as a little bit more complicated than, than either the case that, you, the, the sort of basic case that you were talking about or the other case that, that Sandy asked you about. Because I think that in those cases, the purpose is neither group formation, nor is it to, well, I guess maybe I won't, maybe I'll just let you say what you think <laughs> rather, than, rather than say what I think, yeah. sorry. Yeah, indeed, those are sort of uh, like uh, what I always kind of try to brush it, like derivative cases that require some further further conditions to, to do the explaining work. 
And um, I mean, on the one hand, you, you can have this kind of non-literal slurs, as it were. Uh, so uh, Robin Jeshin discusses this and sort of, uh, yeah, you, you, you jump on a taxi, um, you know, run by um, someone of a, uh, Asian origin and you just say you, you don't take the Anan or something like that. So, uh, so it's interesting because you would think that, yeah, the group membership is like the primary condition that needs to be in place for the, for the slur really to take, to take off because this is, if it's not the right target, it's like, what are you doing? Um, uh, but, but obviously there are those cases where you, you, Purposely, you, you you use the a slur that is not the right one for the the group membership of the target, and I, I think in a way, it's also really interesting because it feels like it's even a sort of a compounded uh, oppressive effect. Not only you, perhaps in a way, is like in this case when you say, "Oh, I don't tip," and um, it's like you treat the target. You put them in a category that that is it, it's even more oppressed than the one that the target really belongs to. Uh, so it's as if like, oh, you should be treated in this way, like those ones that are even lower on the on the on the hierarchy than than your own group membership. Um, so so. And in a way, what you do here is indeed by playing with the social roles, you sort of bring into the conversation a social role that is usually associated with the other, the other group that is even more oppressed, and and sort of by importing those those you know more harmful effects into the into the conversation. So in that sense, I I, I would think interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's even it's even a kind of a compounded harm. Um, that was one point. I think you had some others. Um, but the, the other thing I was asking about was the, the uh, but it's very closely related. I think you sort of answered it too, is, is the use of slurs to maybe imply that you are a member of a group that you don't want to be a member of a group. So in particular, I had in mind like anti-gay slurs. Those are the kinds of things where, you know, I mean, you know, hopefully this happens less, but you know, when I was a young kid, it was very common, especially in sporting conversations where, you know, you would, a, a, one kid would make fun of another by using an anti-gay slur, not necessarily, you know, and then that's a case where it's not, I'm recognizing your membership in that group and thereby slurring you because of it, but rather I'm using the slur both as an insult directly, but also to imply that you're a member of a group or that you may be a member of a group, which I presume that you don't want to be a member of, or socially it's, it's regarded as um, uh, shameful to be a member of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah I, yeah, I don't think I have anything, anything more specific to say other than sort of like redirecting the, the, the sort of the social roles that you do via the conversational, the discourse roles that you bring into the conversation. Um, but, but it's interesting uh, the way you sort of, you, 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 you manipulate that, <laughs> that group membership, which in a way, I was, I was, in a way it's quite interesting because I always thought like, oh, group membership is like this descriptive component that is part of what the slur semantically means. But those cases show that you, you yeah, you, you manipulate even that, that component contextually in order to achieve further, further effects. Uh, yeah, I need to think more more clearly other than kind of saying this this manipulation of via the discourse roles, basically. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, we have um, a question by Roland. Okay, it's rather a remark um, to Kevin's point and very short. So it's also like, um, similar to what I did in my model, you probably have also to distinguish between if the group is clearly, uh, uh, if people can clearly recognize the group or not. Like in your example, you cannot. And then you might have a model where um, it's not clear who belongs to who group and you somehow use this law also like, you know, signal that somebody belongs to it. And, um, the model that also this will be tomorrow presented by Christoph, which is closely related to, mm -hmm. to Michaela's idea, is one where it's clear from the beginning who belongs to whom group. 
So I think this is also an important uh, factor when it's clear then, of course, this kind of uh, uh, throwing effect cannot be there, but if it's not clear, then it's, it's probably also a good, it's a good move for those who want to, uh, you know, put somebody in a different box. So um, this is just a remark that this, we have to probably, it's important to distinguish between these kind of, uh, uh, or the feature of group membership if it's clearly observable or only indirectly. Or, or not at all. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. No, thank you so much. I, I we I haven't thought about the kind of those cases. I see there is a finger from Kaylin. Yeah. So our next question is by Kaylin O'Connor. Huh? It seems to be frozen, huh? Yeah, I think her, her video was frozen. So maybe she has problems with the internet. Um, in this case, I would say we move on to the next question and by Jose Luis. Kaylin no, uh, is back, I just saw her move. Ah, she is, ah, she is back. Mm -hmm. So Kaylin, <laughs> your move. <laughs> your, your All right, I, uh, <laughs> I'm having weird internet problems this morning. There's a big fire out here where I am. So I don't know if that's the reason. Um, this was just like a little finger on Kevin's question, just honestly a question about slurs as he was talking about this kind of scenario. And like, I also was growing up in the 90s in the US and remember those exact sort of anti-gay slurs. But I'm wondering if another thing sort of related to those even counts as a slur, which is when you use a category of group membership just to insult other things randomly. So the kind of case I'm thinking about is like, someone's eating pizza and they don't like it. And they say, this pizza's gay. Like, is that a slur and how would that, yeah, fall under the whole thing? Yeah, I, I must say, I, I haven't thought about those cases. I mean, I, I probably they will fall into what um, uh, Eric Swinson called like a one-off, one-off kind of inventive type of type of slurs and so far they, they're kind of not conventionalized to, to really target a particular group membership and, and in particular when the group membership is like involuntary you, you, you have no choice and um, so they're more as it were yeah contextualized and, and pragmatic uses um, I, I yeah I, I'm not sure <laughs> whether I want to call them slurs or sort of as it were, derivative uses, um, but that, that's a yeah, that's a definitely an interesting point to think about. Okay, then next question is by Jose Luis Bermudas. Yeah, hi. So um, your general, I mean, the general outline must be correct, I think, and you're saying that slurs function essentially as speech acts that devalue social roles by devaluing social conversational roles. So I was just wondering if there is a speech act that works in the opposite direction, one that elevates social roles through elevating discursive roles. And it seems that, you know, there, there must be one, but I can't think of it offhand. Right. No, I was just throwing that, just throwing that over to you, anyone else who can help me. Uh. Uh, so, uh, right, right. So by elevating the discourse role, you also make that person increase, like, yeah, get some social benefits. Do the opposite. Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, the, 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 the case that comes to mind is honorifics. And you know, and you might think that you know we have honorifics in language as a way of, of basically reflecting, uh, you know, deferential or re respect that that kind of um, about social roles that really hold in outside of conversation. But the question is like how how a similar kind of device, you know, can emerge and kind of acquire that that sort of conventional meaning is. Mm, if I'm using this term, I, I become a more, 
I mean, I was thinking of the, the case because indeed you sometimes, as I said, you, you can have a perfect overlap between social roles and conversational roles, and sometimes they can diverge. Think about someone, you know, who's deluded and thinks, I'm Napoleon, I'm Napoleon, and, you know, goes around and, and shouts to everyone and to himself. But would that, would that assignment or kind of assuming a discourse role, would that make it into a, into a social role? That's um, clearly not the case, but would there be a similar case where, whereby a role that emerges out of a, a conversational move, then, I mean, I mean, the, 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 quite, I mean, the, the, the typical case is the performative, where by saying something, you make it the case that that, that this cross role that you know initiates will will be will become a social role, but you need you know you need all all that Austin is telling you that you need for performatives. You need a convention of use. You need uh, you know the authority to make that that pronouncement and and so on. Um, and and clearly, in a way, to move away, uh, yeah, to move from 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 a role assignment a discourse or assignment in a conversation outside of the conversation to make it into a social role, um, you need, you, yeah, you need the conditions for the convention to emerge. You need the, 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 the practice of use, you need the, 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 the people present in the conversation to comply, to, you know, abide to the new convention as it were. I have no clear no clear example of of what it would be. Yeah, I'm 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 not sure that honorifics would work because if it's going to parallel the slur case, there's there's got to be something sort of slightly underhand about it. I mean, the the, the honorifics wear their their function on their on their sleeve, as it were, in the way that slurs don't in in certain contexts, right? I mean, it's. The point about a slur is, is it something that's evaluative, that's masquerading as descriptive? So, you, you, so if you were looking for something working in the other direction, you'd want something that had that same kind of general characteristic. But anyway, it's just a, just yeah. a real yeah. question. It's a real question. Yeah. I don't know the answer. <laughs> but clearly, it will start as a sort of again as a sort of this one-off cases creative, and as long as you sort of manage to to, to create the right conditions for the convention to emerge make it into a practice. I mean, that would be the recipe, but um, on the top of my head, I have no example <laughs> if someone else has. Yeah, thank you. So we have time for one short question, if there, Kevin, if there's, there's one. one. Yeah, sir or madam, when it's only maybe a bit applicable, right? It's the same as the honorific point. Yeah, 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 but yeah, I'm sure there are there are cases. Um, yeah, anyway. Yeah, if there are no further questions, we can make a break and see us in ten minutes again. Thank you very much.